At Category 5 TV, we trust our files to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Whether for your server, laptop, or desktop computer, you'll experience improved performance and reliability. Kingston is with you. Get ready, it's time for the tech. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. Nice to have you back with us again this week. Great to see you. Great to see you, Jeff. You as well. You been well? I've been well. It's Keep December. I, I know. The month of the Christmas. It's crazy. What like, where did this year. year go? I know. I feel like it started, I stayed in my house, and now it's Christmas. Yeah. It's pretty much how it went. You guys been busy? We've been very busy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Christmas time is always you? a busy time, but... Uh, yeah. It's a strange year, too, and, and, you know, going into the stores and trying to do Christmas shopping is very different this year. <sighs> a lot of it happens online. I will admit, I've not stepped into a store to do any buying yet. Really? Yeah. Wow, okay. Well, I, I have, but one of, the, one of the things that happens, of course, being a four-eyed ninja, um, my glasses get fogged completely up. I, I gave up on my glasses this year, to be honest. Yeah, yeah you're... There yeah. you go. That's pretty I can't much see it. a thing. I'm just... Just a round, bald head. See, at least for me, it's it's distance. <laughs> That's where I need my glasses. So within like... Yeah, I need distance and 50 feet, I'm good. And in between. Yeah. yeah. I need all that stuff. So, but what I decided to do, I mean, I've got a 3D printer. Contacts? So I'm like, no, I wish I could do contacts. I've got a, a misshapen retina, so I can't wear no. contacts. So that's just me. I just don't right? like things touching my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> yeah. But um, so I decided, hey, I mean, there's other people that are going through the same thing. So why don't I use my 3D printer to kind of help out with that situation? Oh, okay. So I came across thing number four, six. I'm looking down at my, at my sheet because I could never remember this. Thing number four, six, three, five, four, two, nine by Le Cutter Juan, and I've got the link for you below. And, uh, and what they have come up with is this mask clip. It looks like a dry bandage. But it's just, it's 3D printed on, on the 3D printer here at the studio. And what it does, Jeff, is it, it goes on my uh, reusable mask, yeah, just like that. And then when I wear my mask, it's nice and tight around my nose. Oh, my god! So it doesn't fog up my glasses. And yep. I'd say, like, huge, huge difference. So I'm like, okay, well, th this is working for me. So I'm going to see if I can print more and, and give them out. So right. that's what I've been doing. And, and huh. so that's something that I've been learning is with my 3D printer, can I, like, do that kind of thing? Because this that's is the kind cool. of thing. I'm sure there'll be a dime a dozen at the dollar store oh, easily. in a couple months. But right now, it's not something that's available. So That's interesting. I got on Thingiverse, I downloaded the thing, and I started printing them, and they come out <laughs> like this. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> so you get, you know, I get a sheet of 40 of them, and they're all tied together. But then as I'm, you know, I'm just learning how to manufacture, I'm realizing, okay, well, this is actually a fair bit of work, because now I've got to tear each one off the sheet, and they come and off like this. clean them up. And i got to clean them off. i got to get all the burrs off. i got to cut them up. i got to um, use a file uh, to clean those up. And, yep. and so each one takes me like about five minutes to get it all like ready for somebody yeah. to use. So, so the cost is really, really cheap. I mean, I can print them myself, and they're six cents each. Wow. But then you look at, okay, well, print time for 40 of them is 18 hours. Right. Plus, get deburring, the them. Up <laughs> deburring them is another five minutes per. So it starts to be like, wow, you, you can never make a business out of this. No. But it's something that I'm you know, like giving away to family and friends who have that same problem. But, that but for me personally, it's fantastic. And then the kids who have glasses as well, all I did was I took it and I shrunk it down 70 I was about to ask, is it customizable? Well, yeah, because it's just a file on my computer. Oh. So I can just shrink it down and, and print it for a smaller mask, and there you go. Very cool. So, I mean, once again, 3D printing is, is showing itself to be something that is really, really practical, really useful. And in a That's situation neat. where there's a product that you can't go out and buy in the store yet, but right. everybody wants one. So, hey, again, link is below. So if you have a 3D printer and you got the same problem that I do, walking into the stores and it's just fog, well, this is going to help you out a lot. So, hey, 3D print one. If you don't have a 3D printer and you want me to send you one, I'm sure we could find a way. That's right. Just know that uh, my, my cost is $0.06, cents, but you factor in the labor and they're $20 each. <laughs> 
<laughs> plus shipping and handling. <laughs> plus shipping and handling. That's a forty dollar part right there. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's oh. the thing, right? So I mean, some company's going to come and start printing those or, or extruding them or, or doing some kind of new process that's really really quick and easy, yeah. and they'll be able to do it. So is there? I wonder. Could you save on the cleanup time by printing them as singles? That way you don't have this Can back end. Remember when I said it takes 18 hours to print a sheet of 40 of them? Well, yeah. So if I was sitting in front of my 3D printer and wanted to print one at a time, sure, yeah, I could probably save some time. Well, I just didn't know if, like, I've never 3D printed before. Yeah, yeah. So I just didn't know if you could, like, print one here and then two inches over print another one, or does it all still link it? You could, but with these, Jeff, they're so they're so fine that there's not a lot of surface to touch the, the platform of the 3D printer. Right? Oh, okay. So what ends up happening is you get halfway through the print and it loses its adhesion. So it's right. no longer stuck to the printer, and so then as the print head is going over it, it moves it. And then that's you've got a, a botched print. So that's where this sheet comes in, which is actually called, a, uh, I guess, a skirt or something like that. Right. Um, but it basically gives you more surface area to adhere to the 3D printer. Makes sense. But yes, I mean, if you really, really dialed in that 3D printer, that's you know you maybe go a, that a goal to, to be able to do, hey, if you want to start a business, printing these things. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> all so, the, all something to do in to your non-spare time. Yes, yeah, but uh, a way to, to, to give back, we'll say. Very but cool. That's, so that's what I've been up to. What have you been up to? Oh, I've been busy yeah. uh, making websites and stuff. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, I, got, I got a new phone. You got a new phone? I got a new What'd phone. What'd you get? I got the Samsung A71. Okay. Um, it's a nice phone. It's, I, it, we seem to go through these trends where it's like phones would get bigger and then they get smaller. And now I think we're going back to bigger phones because this thing doesn't even fit in my pocket. Really? It's a big freaking yeah. phone. Yeah. It's my, nice and tall. My, uh, uh, my Pocophone F1, is, it, it's probably a you know, slightly larger phone than what I'm used to well, that's, previously. That's mine. Oh, yeah. Yours is, yours is like the, the granddaddy yeah. of my F1. And, and this wasn't even the biggest one. Yeah. I was like, my goodness. They're like phablets at this point. Uh, pretty much, yeah. But I will say, I like the size. I've never had a phone with a big hard drive. Like my the, first, the I remember my first so iPhone. You, the size, you like the capacity of it? I love the capacity. Really? This is 128 gig. Okay. The biggest phone I've ever had is 32. But you're using Android. So unlike Apple, why don't you just throw another SD card in there? Well, that's the thing. When it comes to Android, even like I have an SD card in here that's, uh, I think it's a 256. Yeah. Um, but the problem is the apps themselves do not install on the SD card. Okay. They install on the phone. Right. So it'd be just like, um, you know, if you had an app on your, you know, computer, yeah. you couldn't install it on a USB. The right. data to it, you could put on a USB, but yeah. the app itself is on your, your C mm -hmm. drive. Mm -hmm. um, so same deal. So I end up like running out of space. They've got to make that easier. I find that too with my phone. Um, like I do have a 256 gig Kingston SD card in here. It gives me a ton of storage space for right. my photos, for videos. I do a yes. lot of video shooting and it's a 4K camera. Yep. But um, it automatically stores to the built-in storage. Yes. Then I can transfer it to the SD card which yep. is great. I do that in the field to, to free up some space for more shooting. Yep. yep. But why can't you just select to always save I to know. the SD card? That's what I want. Ow. And some apps do it, but not all apps do. And I'm thinking specifically about you, DJI. Well, Come on the, now. That's the thing. There are some apps that you can set in the settings that it, the default save is to your SD card. Yeah. But I do remember at one point, I don't remember which phone it was that I had, there was a setting where when you put an SD card in, you can have the phone recognize the SD card as part of the internal hard drive, or uh, like the actual storage. Oh, so it just expands It just the expands storage. the whole oh, thing. Oh, yes. Now, how it works with partitioning, I don't know, but it just looked like I had a 64 gig. Yeah. And so I would, it would say, oh, you've got room for your apps and all that. And so mm -hmm. how it worked, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's but, magic. Right. But the challenge I had is when um, my wife and I went for vacation to Hawaii. Yeah. First day there, taking a bunch of photos. My SD card fails. No. So <laughs> I was quite frustrated oh. because I didn't have my computer for a backup. It was not a Kingston SD card. It was not a Kingston SD card. Uh, see, I see how I just knew that. Yeah, I knew you did. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, the, the SD card failed, and so I lost half my apps because of that oh, dude, merge that feature. Hurts. 
So I lost half the apps. I lost all my photos. Yeah. And I was like, I don't have a computer to back it up to. Is like, it possible that you bought a fake SD card? No, it was a legit SD card. It was legit? Yeah, it, it was uh, It was fail. a SanDisk, I think. But was it a SanDisk? Oh, no, it was a SanDisk. All right. Yeah. If it wasn't, then... Well, we've done... Uh, yeah. Sasha and I took a look at some fake SD cards. I remember that. That I was able to buy off of Amazon. And it's a real eye-opener. And maybe this is important for you to note as we're going into... You know, it's the Christmas season and maybe yes. you've got some gifts under the tree and you've got SD cards for various devices. It's important for you to note that. So I've got the link for that video for you as well. Yes. Uh, up there and in the description below. Depends on where you're watching. If you're watching this on cable TV, obviously nothing I say really works. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, you know, go to our website, category5.tv. Do a quick search for fake SD card. It's really, really important for you to know. It was a great that feature. These exist. Yeah. After that, I used it on a bunch of my SD cards. Them. You got to be careful what yeah. ones you get and where you get them from. Because they can silk screen a card and make it look like a sand desk. Absolutely. For sure. And yep. if it fails and you've got all your photos on it. The yeah. nice thing about a situation like that, and, and we do this with our Nintendo Switch. So uh, Kingston has brought out an, an actual Nintendo Switch optimized uh, SD card. Oh, cool. Card. And so you can store all your game data and all your games on the SD card. And then what do you do? You shut down the Switch. You take the SD card out. You put it in your computer. And you make a backup. Yes. Right. So if it ever failed, or if you ever ran out of space and you wanted to add more space, you could transfer that data absolutely and move it around to another yep. card. So yep. that's pretty brilliant. So that's good. Yeah, I love technology. Speaking of Kingston, now I name drop a little bit, but Kingston is you know I I really do stand by uh, their products. Uh, solid I've been products. using them. Yeah, it's quite literally solid yeah. state products, Jeff. And uh, I had this issue where here at the studio, we ran out of space on our server. Yeah. We're live right now, but guess what we're doing? We are recording multiple camera shots in 4K to a server. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're out of space on said server, that can be a bit of a brutal nightmare for yeah. uh, production companies such as Category 5 TV. So, um, so I got a hold of some Kingston DC 500 drives Ooh. and started doing some tests. We're going to be looking at that tonight. Uh, Mark Noland is uh, going to be joining us to talk with us about how these are improving the, the performance of the server. So there's the capacity thing, but then there's also the actual performance mm -hmm. of, hey, like I'm producing 4K video. Well, the old spinner drives are really having a hard time keeping up. Oh, yeah. So we're going to jump into that in a couple of moments time. Before we do, I want to remind you, hey, we are on YouTube. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up. Give us a like and a subscribe. If you do subscribe, it's important to also click that bell so you get notifications yes. every time we're live. That's a really great way to keep tabs on what's going on here at Category 5 Technology TV. So I'm going to jump over to the bridge, Jeff, because uh, we've got Mark standing by. Okay. I'm going to head over there. You take well, it from here. While Robbie's going off to the bridge, I want to encourage you, check out our website, category5.tv. There's tons of stuff on there. You can check out past episodes. You can also download all of our episodes. We've got everything on a torrent file. You want to get that, see what's been going on for the last 14 seasons. It's amazing stuff. And as well, check out our shop and buy all the cool stuff that we've been telling you about on the show. All right, let's head over to the bridge. A bit of backstory for you before we jump into an interview with Mark Noland at Kingston Technology. The server we use here at the studio has been low on space for some time. I've actually had to delete things in order to make room for the shows each week. It's an old server, but it still runs great. A bit on the loud side with those Dell cooling fans, but it runs well, so there's no reason to replace it yet. The storage, however, could use an upgrade. Since transitioning our editing to 4K last fall, it's become obvious that not only is the storage array too small, but the drives aren't fast enough either. So after some research, I picked up Kingston Data Center SSDs. They've got ECC to protect against data corruption, and they're meant for business use in the data center. Now, my data center, as you could, this is it. <laughs> I've got a single old Dell R510 server, uh, but what we'll cover today is completely scalable. I don't want to give you the wrong impression, whether you're a very small business like myself, even a home server, uh, or a web host or large enterprise with many servers, the point is that these competitively priced enterprise SSDs from Kingston can really improve your server's performance. Uh, 
Now for my use here at Category 5 TV, I went with the DC500Rs because they're optimized for read intensive application. That should do really well for our video editing. Of course, I also use the server for general data storage to hold past seasons of videos. Plus I run a few virtual machines on there to run our internal infrastructure. Um, so needless to say, Kingston's DC500Rs are gonna be ideal not just for my general use, but the bursts of sudden read speed I need when loading big video files. They've also got DC500Ms as well, uh, and if you need higher write speed, those will fit the bill, being a really great big bang for the buck all-round SSD for servers. I wanted to know how much of a difference the upgrade actually made. So I set up a comparison with the hopes of making it as close of a one-to-one -one as possible. So I chose a RAID 5 with four disks each. And before I ran the tests, I updated the RAID controller firmware. While it is an old server, I thought it'd be best to make sure everything is as up to date as possible. From there, along with some helpful advice from Kingston's FIO expert, Matt Eaton, I wrote a benchmark script that I could run against both my original spinning drives and the new Kingston SSDs, giving me a pretty good view of how the performance compares. The code's on my GitHub page and the link is in the video description below. Huge thanks to Matt for all of his help and also Dave Leong for, among other things, helping connect me with the right people at Kingston. I did a fair amount of preconditioning on the drives, though time was of a factor here as well. And since the spinners were taking an unreal amount of time to precondition, I did cut that process short. It should be noted too that the drives are different capacities, so this is by no means apples to apples, but in a real world environment such as ours here at the studio, I'm happy just to know that there's a perceptible improvement with reasonably accurate numbers to back that up. I brought the server nearly to its knees. The FIO tests were brutal on these old spinner drives, uh, but they completed way faster on the SSDs. So I grabbed some 2.5 to 3.5 inch adapters that'll match up nicely with the server's backplane since the Dell trays only support 3.5 inch drives. Firing up the server with the SSDs and all appears to work great, but all the drives are flashing an amber light. I asked Mark from Kingston if this was a concern. Well, uh, with Dell, where did you get the drive sled? Wait a minute. So you're telling me these fancy expensive drive adapters are what's causing this? It's the drive sled. The drive set has a chipset on it. All right, let's try a different approach then. Commander Muffiff posted Thing 1830990 to Thingiverse, which looks promising. I've got the link in the description below. Let's give it a shot. Success! The Kingston DC500s connected directly to the backplane using 3D printed adapters did the trick. Now I'd like to briefly digress because this is another testament to the cost savings of owning a 3D printer. Now I paid $16 each for these adapters. The ones I printed myself, these worked better. And now, while I used expensive PLA Plus filament, which costs $40 per kilogram, each tray adapter, which is 14 grams, uh, price, that prices it at only 56 cents each. So the material cost being 56 cents, I saved $15.44 per tray adapter. That's a grand total of $123.52 saved to print eight adapters myself. If I did that just two more times, I've already offset the upfront expense of buying my 3D printer in savings alone. Anyway, back to our subject, but first a quick word from our sponsors. When we return, Mark Nolan joins us from Kingston to make sense of the file results and talk about how business users can further improve the performance of the data center. Stick around.
I've run the FIO tests on all the drives, and I've passed the numbers on to the team at Kingston so they can help make sense of the test results. And here's what those numbers look like. So in the middle column there, I've got the four Dell Constellation ES drives. Those have the SAS interface running at 7200 RPM, and I've configured them in a RAID 5. You can see the IOPS input output per second uh, is very, very poor by contrast to the SSDs in the far right column. Those are the DC 500 Rs from Kingston, and those again are configured in the same way, a RAID 5 with four drives. However, these ones are one terabyte drives versus the spinning drives that are two terabytes each. No not apples to apples, but you can see clearly that the speed is significantly improved on the SSDs. Mark Noland is a field application engineer from Kingston Technology. Mark, thanks for taking the time to speak with me. Howdy. How are you today? Great. Tell us a little bit about what it is that you do at Kingston. Uh, so I'm, my title is field applications engineer, uh, but I interface a lot with uh, clients and users at data centers. Um, I also, you know, in my background, I, I used to work for Autodesk uh, in the film and video industry mm. um, and dealt with like sort of everything from the desktop application back to the data center, you know. Uh, so if you, if you break a bottleneck at the desktop, you know, then your next bottleneck is the network. And once you break that, then your bottleneck is on the server. And so um, just basically trying to troubleshoot and and break bottlenecks, whether it's, you know, uh, databases or, you know, uh, 8K video editing systems, mm. uh, things like that. Uh, they all need uh, big, fast data going through pipes. Don't I know it. Don't I know it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So you've seen. That's quite a setup you've got there. Cheers. Yeah. Uh, well, and you've seen our FIO numbers from our test today. Um, and I, I do realize that those numbers are slightly arbitrary. Um, however, what I did is I ran the same tests against the same scenario on our old spinning drives as I did on DC 500Rs. So just looking at those numbers, can you help us to make sense of what's, what's actually happening there? Uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, first of all, both, you know, both the SSDs and the hard drives are connected to the SATA bus. Right. Uh, same server, like all of the, the hardware is the same, just the drives have changed. Yeah. The SATA bus is one of the older um, connection methods in, in the, in the computer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it has, uh, you know, a few uh, uh, weaknesses in that uh, sort of, you can only be reading or writing to it at any one time. Uh, but, the, you know, with RAID controllers and that, they've gotten really good at being able to optimize that uh, the best way possible. So then you come down to the uh, raw, you know, uh, interface differences between a hard drive, spinning disk, and SSDs. And, you know, SS, uh, SSDs have been modified. You know, it's a, a, a solid state disk. It's basically you've got computer memory NAND that is being uh, routed to speak uh, disk language, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, uh, in a way, you're sort of uh, hobbling the uh, the uh, fast NAND that's in there by making it go through the uh, uh, SATA interface. Sure. But uh, it has to pretend that it is. Uh, it has to like at least translate to speak disk language. So when you've got like uh, the old school hard spinning disk hard drives, um, you know, they're, they're pretty good at doing sequential stuff. Uh, random, they start choking. And when it comes to IOPS, um, they, they really have a hard time keeping up with uh, um, the memory. And you can see, you know, which parts are uh, uh, in the difference between your test scores. You can see which parts are, you know, low because of the spinning disk itself. Yeah. And ones that you know uh, uh, are like the uh, NAND on an SSD is actually able to you know still put pretty good uh, bandwidth through. So like uh, in your in your uh, read and write performance, um, you know the SSDs are anywhere between like on the read maybe four times faster than uh, the fastest rate of hard drives that you have going. Right. Um, this is also you're doing RAID 5, so there's a little bit of overhead with disk management. So if you did RAID 0 on both the Ooh. SSDs and... and <laughs> I need well, redundancy. Yeah, no, you, yeah, yeah. 
you, you have no redundancy. But if you do RAID zero, you know that you can see raw bandwidth sure. uh, happening, right? Yeah. Uh, but and and that that's when SSDs would even take a step above. You know, SAT SSDs would be even faster uh, without that redundancy happening, because mm. uh, there's a certain amount of uh, overhead that's happening to to do that. But uh, even with your RAID five setup, you're still looking at uh, about three times faster for SSDs than hard drives uh, on a, on a re, on a write mm -hmm. and four times faster on the read uh, typically. But the the one sort of secret place that it ends up being much much faster is uh, in the latency. So that's like the time between when I click and submit a request to the time that uh, it actually starts happening. Right. Um, you know, if, if if it's like a random I/O uh, event. It might be, you know, uh, when your drives are warmed up and everything, it might be uh, like 0.8 milliseconds to 1.2 milliseconds, depending. Uh, whereas on the SSD, it's going to be microseconds. So even if it's 20 microseconds uh, and you have a rate of four drives, if you say that your average latency per drive was one millisecond on a hard drive and it's like 20 microseconds on the SSD, then uh, you haven't even gotten to a microsecond by the time you add up that latency uh, across the four drives. Wow. So um, it, it, the latency is a big difference and then the quality of service. So one of the things that we really tested the data center, the DC 500 and 450 and DC 1000 drives, uh, they're, they're tested extensively for you know uh, quality of service. That's the main, the main thing you're looking for if you're putting them into a, a data center like tier two cloud something like that mm -hmm. uh, you want a quality of service where uh you know a consumer ssd might peak and deliver super performance for a short period of time and if you're only transferring a couple gigs at a time that's what you want it's on your laptop right you know you're trying to get things on and off really quick that's awesome but if you're if you're running a drive you know, 24 seven with a database with, for online transactions, uh, you're writing to it and reading from it like constantly. Mm -hmm. And you you don't wanna see big spikes up or down in the performance. You wanna see like a, a really flat line in that performance. And, and you'll see that with like a hard drive, you know, uh, it'll spike up really fast initially because it's got a oh, big yeah. DRAM cat. <laughs> Anytime you're and transferring a video file or something, it's like yeah. fast and then... And then it'll <laughs> plummet down to, all right, 200 megabytes per second. And then it goes 30 megabytes yes. per second. And you're like, <laughs> what happened? Yeah. Uh, and, and the problem is that at a certain point, you're running out of cash or oh, something like that. Okay. So in, in that, uh, you know, in, in your uh, FIO script, uh, one of the important things to do if you're wanting to test for data center use is to do that uh, warm up on the drive to have it burned in so that uh, it's not just like fresh out of the box. I just installed it and all the sectors are blank and and you know like because uh, it's not having to have any overhead of managing uh, data on the drive right, that you okay. would see when the drives in use. Mm -hmm. So is that the and, is that kind of the key difference between the consumer SSDs that I have in my laptop in my home computers versus these data center drives? Yeah, that and uh, you might see over provisioning differences, um, like our uh, DC uh, drives. Um, number one, they have a, a decent amount of uh, DRAM mm -hmm. cache on them, uh, where a lot of consumer drives might have. Uh, uh, pseudo SLC, where they take TLC or QLC memory and program it as SLC. So rather than, you know, they might take a sector, a section of the drive and, and say, this is going to be programmed as SLC. So I'm only going to store one bit of data in this cell instead of the three or four. Like if it's uh, TLC, you're storing three bits of data and, and uh, or bytes and, and, uh, and, QLC, you're storing four. So you've got much more data that's being stored there. Uh, you know, we had MLC, uh, but then it was TLC and yeah, QLC. And, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're trying to cram more, more bits into uh, uh, the more cells. Uh, and as you do that, it gets, you know, uh, it takes a little longer to program uh, all those uh, bytes and bits into uh, the different cells. So if you use the pseudo cache of SLC, which we do on a few drives as well in consumer, uh, but uh, you're 
it, the reason you do it is that it's much less expensive than using DRAM. Hmm. And so uh, on our on our data center drives, they're, they all have like a nice big DRAM cache on them. And that's one of the big differences. Oh, okay. And so uh, that, that combined with uh, the over provisioning that is on uh, our data center drives allows for, uh, and, as well as tweaks in the firmware, it allows for really a uh, high level of quality of service. So you don't see big spikes way up and then way down and, and going, you know, right. like where you're at the max performance of the bus down to zero back to the middle. And mm -hmm. are you, uh, you when know, you say, when you say you, over provisioning, are you talking about IO? Now over provisioning is where if I have, like if, if you see uh, an SSD that has, say it has 940 or 960 gigs. Yeah. Uh, of 960 gig capacity is really common, right? Yeah. That, that's a terabyte of NAND that's on there, mm -hmm. and it has over-provisioning of uh, 3 to 5%. For the data uh, itself, the, so the storage. Yeah. Okay. And so when, when you see a drive that says one terabyte, uh, lots of times that's still the same amount of NAND as if you bought a, a 960, but the, the thing that you'll notice is, like on a consumer drive, if you get up to being... 90% full on one that's not over provisioned, mm -hmm. you'll start, you'll see the performance also start to tank. Whereas oh. if you have one that, if you have the, you know, the 960 gig drive, it can be 90% full and you'll still be writing at the same speed as when it was empty. Hmm. Uh, you know, it, you, it, well, I won't say when it was empty because one of the things that we do that uh, preconditioning, right, mm -hmm. uh, that's part of our uh, script that we, we, we're working on there, uh, that preconditioning, basically make sure that it, the drive's sort of dirtied up and and uh, is doing real workload type stuff. So you, right. can, cause you can test anything out of the box and it might look spectacular, but then when you put it into real use, uh, throw it into a data center and, you know, a week into being used, you're like, this is not performing the way it did, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I threw these consumer drives in there and they were great. And now they're uh, terrible. Yeah. Um, oh, I see that like on my. Yeah, I've seen that on desktop drives and and things like that. Yeah, when they get warmed up and dirty, and they start. Uh, they they're under real world working conditions and mm -hmm. not just running a benchmark. Hmm. And now my IOPS on the and you mentioned IOPS. Maybe I could get you to briefly explain what that means to us. Um, but it is through the roof higher uh, on the SSDs. What does that yep. What does that tell us? So uh, part of that is is because of the it's physics, right? So on the science, SSD, kids. It's, it's science. <laughs> it, we're talking about physics because the uh, hard drive is actually relying uh, for the IOPS. It actually has that that needle that moves back and forth with the reader the head. Physical drives, yeah. The the spinning and, drives. And, and so it actually has to in order to read a point. It has to physically move to somewhere, find that, read it, uh, verify it, and then move to the next point, find it, read it, and verify it. So uh, just because of the way physics and thermo thermodynamics work, the drive can't spin any faster. They, you know, Hard drives are really, really great for what they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you can get really big hard drives and they're pretty durable. Uh, but physics can't take them any farther. Because, and, and so when you go over to yeah, uh, an SSD, uh, you're just, everything's uh, done through solid state. You're not moving anything mm -hmm. except electrons. And so, uh, you know, you're, you, you have like your seek times go down by a thousand fold. Uh, and that's why you'll see what the IOPS difference um, the random read, which was your best on the uh, hard drives, random read of 673 IOPS, whereas the random read on the RAID of uh, DC500R was 121,000 IOPS. So uh, <laughs> 180 times the speed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just a little faster. A little bit. <laughs> That's amazing. So uh, now we understand now that, so I've jumped from um, going from the spinning drives to the SSDs, now my bottleneck is SATA, the yep. the connection. Yeah, so so uh, that uh, 121,000 IOPS 
uh, uh, with that, if you went to, now you go to PCIe based drives, mm -hmm. uh, PCIe Gen 3 NVMe type drives. Uh, so either uh, M.2 or U.2. Um, U.2 is more friendly to a data center because it is in that two and a half inch form factor right. rather than the, the gum stick form factor, which is a little difficult to manage. There's a few people that have uh, adapters and things like that to put lots of M.2s into servers. But, hmm. um, you know, I think that the, the U.2 and the ruler are going to be much more common uh, going forward for putting in lots of, you know, like 24 or more uh, U.2 drives, uh, like NVMe SSDs into a server. Uh, but now you're talking like the IOPS go up another f factor. Right. Um, so like uh, an NVMe drive, because it's not limited to uh, by the SATA bus, uh, it, it uh, is limited by the PCIe bus. So, um, you know, you go to Gen 4, and that's twice as fast as Gen 3. So, you know, potentially twice as fast. I haven't seen any models where, it, uh, like, it, it is twice as fast, but, you know, significantly, Gen 4 demos that I've seen are significantly faster. Like, uh, uh, you know, you're talking off of, by 16, uh, I think I, the fastest demo I've seen so far is about 25 gigabytes per second off of one device on one Gen 4 Gigabytes slot. per gigabytes second. Gigabytes per second, wow. yeah. So, and, and I don't know how scalable that is currently, but that was when Gen 4 was still experimental, which it's a little experimental. I think the AMD one is, is looking really good, but... Uh, uh, I'll call it kind of experimental until Intel and AMD both have their Gen 4 out and, and uh, all of the uh, enterprise servers are shipping with Gen 4 PCIe because yeah. at this point it, it's a really cool gamer box or a, a really <laughs> high end, a really high end workstation. Sure. You know, like it, uh, NVIDIA's got a lot of cool demos with four GPUs on an AMD proc with, uh, you know, lots of NVMe uh, uh drives connected to it and they're doing some really neat demos and as is amd with their their gpus um but all, all of that right now seems it, it it's like uh, if i have to go drop uh five to 20 grand on a workstation um I, i'm gonna wait till it's uh somebody else uh works out all the wrinkles in that yeah. experiment. <laughs> so thinking about my use case, so I obviously work here in a studio, so I'm doing a lot of video production. Uh, maybe some of our viewers are working in an office environment where they've got similar scenarios where, hey, we've got to replace the drives in an older server, or maybe it's not even that old, but um, they're, they're not necessarily replacing an entire server. They just want to put SSDs in instead of the spinning drives because they're kind of the way to go right now. And, and we're certainly seeing a big performance boost here. Um, is there, you know, where, where is the performance gain? So for me, it's, it's in editing real time 4k video. It's, it's brilliant on the, on the DC 500 Rs. Um, where, where is the, the average business consumer um, IT department going to find gains uh, by upgrading the servers to SSD? Well, I, I think uh, client satisfaction and uh, my, my uh, dad's a dentist and my mom's a lawyer and, and uh, I used to do some computer tech support for people in those communities and, and you know, like uh, uh, doctors and lawyers are notoriously cheap when it comes to, you know, like uh, spending money on, on systems like that. <laughs> but uh, systems also drive all of the, uh, all of the, uh, revenue in their business. So it's really important for them to keep them updated. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it, I think the thing that you get by going from hard drive to SSDs on an upgrade of an older system, you know, is you'll be able to wring at least two or three more years out of it, if not more. Um, you know, you'll, you, you'll, you always hit a bottleneck somewhere, but rather than your system being the bottleneck, it might be the OS or the version of the software that you're using, or right. something like that. But uh, you, you'll make something much more usable. I don't, have you ever taken an old hard drive SS or a whole old hard drive laptop and put an SSD in it and 
you know, it's like all of a sudden it's like, what, why was I going to get rid of this thing? It's so fast. <laughs> exactly. It like breathes new life into an old <laughs> system. And that's exactly yeah. what this has done for our server. And I, and as you're talking about bottlenecks, I'm thinking, okay, well, SATA is six gig a second. So I think my bottleneck actually, Mark, is going to be my networking because I'm only on gig in, uh, ethernet. So yeah. that's my bottleneck. But it, being a, a very small business myself, having gig inter, uh, ethernet and being able to edit video over one gig a second is is stellar it's superb um well the the, the trick you know for that like because my job was breaking those kind of bottlenecks uh previously is i would put uh, 10 gig uh on your server and yep. have a switch that distributes it out to your gigabit clients and 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 tell you uh get uh 10 gig uh at your desktop or something but you could always go you know like uh, do it gradually just like adding uh, SSDs to your uh, uh, legacy systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a good idea. Just kind of upgrade the the networking as I go. <laughs> that's the next step. Yeah. Um, what kind of longevity am I going to be looking at um, for SSDs? I know, like when SSDs first came out, so years ago, um, there were those of us who were uh, hesitant and afraid to switch to SSD because the they weren't quite as reliable. But that has completely changed over the past several years are we yeah. like what kind of lifespan do we expect from like your your data center drives uh so our data center drives we warrant them for five years uh or, and then you know like the they have different um drive rights per day warranties as well so like the dc 500 that's a 0.3 drive right per day so if you have a four terabyte or a three three point uh, was it 3.86? Uh, if you have a four, essentially there's four terabytes of NAND on there, but if you have like a four terabyte drive or an eight terabyte drive of the R, which is a read centric model, you can get uh, up to, uh, you can do uh, 0.3 drive writes per day. Um, uh, the M version of that is 1.5 drive writes per day. And if you mm. think about that, for a four terabyte drive, that's if a you're lot of data. Writing, yeah. If you're writing, uh, you know, like uh, six terabytes a day, uh, you might be running Facebook off of your uh, <laughs> server. I don't know. That, that's a lot of data to fill up and delete. Because that's it, it's not so much about, um, you know, like if you're just collecting drives, uh, collecting data on your drives. That's what the R is all about, right? So the read centric one, if I want to like have a database full of video and images and text files and spreadsheets and stuff that's going to live there forever, um, the the DC 500 R is a really great drive because I'm just adding stuff to it all the time. I'm not adding, you know, like a terabyte at a time and then calculating that data and deleting the whole thing and, and putting in the answer that's another terabyte. Um, you know, that that's something like, uh, uh, lamp where you've got you know Apache server and and or an OLTP server or you know some kind of online transaction thing where you know uh, uh, you're you're just grinding through the data like you know mm -hmm. Facebook where you're just adding new cat videos all the time and then deleting them <laughs> as they get old right um, you know uh, most people don't do that like I, I've got a, a Drobo uh, server that I just add stuff to constantly so. Mm -hmm. Uh, I actually had to uh, unplug it because it's so loud because of all the hard drives. I'm going to put uh, four four terabyte SSDs in there. Perfect. That'll make it quiet. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's whisper quiet all of a sudden. It, it's interesting and, you say that, like, because that's the other thing that we don't necessarily think about with the upgrade is the the silence of them. The energy efficiency. Yeah. Well, I, I I have to say that SSDs. Uh, compared to hard drive energy efficiency, hard drives are actually really good at when they're not being used, shutting down. Like they, they've, they've really gotten good at being energy efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't think that anybody's replacing hard drives with like, uh, well, they have their that's place. exactly what we are they exactly have their place. replacing hard drives, yeah. but they have their places. Like uh, if I want to store 40 uh, terabytes of data that's just cold data mm -hmm. that I'm not going to access all the time, but I re I need for legal reasons or mm -hmm. uh, you know like to make me feel secure or it's my backup. 
that's a perfect use for hard drives. If, if you have data that you want to be able to read and work off of, uh, hard drives are terrible for that just because of the latency. And, you know, it's like if you're one user and you are getting the data off the hard drives, it's bad enough to have to wait for it. But if you've got like 10 users or even, you know, three or four users that are all hitting that uh, hard drive array at the same time, you can start, you know, like, hey, you know, like, why, why is everything slowing down so yeah. much? And it's like, um, you know, uh, you, you'll also see a lot better multi-user uh, efficacy happening when, uh, when you go to uh, SSDs, hmm. just because of the, the latency. Lots of great information. I mean, I'm, I'm all kinds of thoughts going through my head. I'm thinking about how some servers, like you've got multiple users all connecting for Samba shares and accessing files or even accessing things like their bookkeeping software simultaneously on a single spinning hard drive in a s system or something. It's like the, the difference in the... Well, if, if you think about the, the uh, VM language of spin up a, a virtual machine... Yeah. Uh, when you are coming off of uh, a SATA drive, there's still a little spin up time, but it it's like a fraction of uh, what the spin up time, because it really is a spin up time off of hard drives. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you go to NVMe, it's it's almost like it was in DRAM. You know, it's like because the NVMe drives being the, you know, it's off the SATA bus and onto the uh, PCIe bus, it's one step closer to the uh, processor. Mm -hmm. Uh, we kind and that's of, why like DRAM is the best because it's on the processor, right? Sure. Or even the, the, you know, I guess the cache and the processor is on the processor, but it's also not connected to your uh, display and, and all that. So yeah. uh, DRAM is sort of the king, of, and which we also make. There, there's all these um, kind of irrelevant almost benchmarks of people turning on their computer and how long does it take to boot? And it's, and it's, it's kind of irrelevant in so many ways and it makes me think about those spinning those drives spinning up we have such a uh we we have a tendency to look at okay when i click on something how quickly does it happen how quickly does that application come up and for me in this scenario how quickly am i able to open large video files in my editor and right. that's like where yeah i'm not having to wait for for that that moment is just an instant moment for me I would do uh, so. I, I, a lot of the I would create demos for when we go to trade shows like NIB, the broadcasters, uh, North American Broadcasters Show, or IBC mm -hmm. in Amsterdam. Uh, I'd create some demos with Adobe, and uh, you know, one of the things that we'd have to do there is like if we're editing 8K or you know 4K or 8K video, you have to make sure that the clips are long enough to uh, blow out any. DRAM that you have, oh. uh, you know, because if, if, you know, like if I'm editing and it's really small files, they could all just live in DRAM or, you know, and I wouldn't know the difference. Wow. You know, it's like it could be coming off a hard drive, but the first time I read it, it's really slow. But after that, it's nice and fast because uh, the if the files are tiny. But if you are trying to pull like 4K still frames rather than an AVI or a QuickTime, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that because the uh, AVI or QuickTime might be able to be stored in if you have 64 or 128 gigs of memory in your system, right. you might be able to store most of the video there. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, you don't really see the performance of uh, the SSDs until you have something that sort of outmatches the amount of DRAM that you have available to you. Mark, if I may change directions just a little bit as we approach closing our interview off, um, one of the things as a business user that are that's really important to me is knowing that I can get support when I need it. And throughout the course of this process in upgrading my server, uh, one of the things that really stands out to me is the fact that your team was there for me every step of the way. Um, is that is that pretty typical of Kingston? Uh, before I worked here, I. I didn't know that much about Kingston. I've, I've worked here for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really uh, blew me away was the level of support. So uh, if you have a, whether you have a problem with like a, a HyperX uh, microphone like this or the headset uh, or a keyboard or DRAM or uh, an SSD, if you call our support number, we have people uh, here in Southern California and Orange County that answer the phone. There's not a data center somewhere around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so during the day, it's going to be people in Orange County. If you call at three in the morning, it's going to be people in England. Very good. Um, 
So we've got a uh, really great support where if you have a real problem that they can't solve with, uh, you know, the all their known database of issues, uh, it ends up to me and the engineering team for SSDs if it goes to us, um, it, like within a half an hour, it, it's in our inbox and huh. and you've got like a whole engineering team from uh, Southern California to uh, Europe and, and Taiwan that are all dealing with it uh, personally. So fantastic. Uh, I think that's one of the big differences. Like a, I, I've had problems with uh, drives from other manufacturers that I've worked at other manufacturers and, and I couldn't get anybody to right. support me hmm. <laughs> at the manufacturer that I worked at previously. Wow. Uh, That's great. And uh, there's something to be said for good support. Absolutely. Um, now, you mentioned the HyperX line of consumer products. Of course, I've experienced it from the enterprise kind of level. Um, is this you know, level of support something that can be expected from consumers as well as business users? Well, yeah, absolutely. Like I was saying, like uh, uh, we've we've actually had people, you know, like with broken keyboards or, you know, it's a, it's uh, you know, it's it's all one number. I mean, Kingston, and uh, you know, has the HyperX brand for gaming, but we also do you know high-end uh, server products, DRAM and SSDs mm -hmm. uh, for the data center, as well as you know consumer DRAM and consumer SSDs and USB sticks uh, from consumer ones to all the way to the encrypted ones with keypads on them. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the other things that also surprised me coming from another uh, company to Kingston was uh, the level of testing. So 100% uh, of our data center uh, SSDs and, and DRAM, there, there, there is every piece is tested. Uh, they, you know, like they, uh, the server stuff goes through a more rigorous test, uh, but they simulate like three months worth of uh, 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 use on the D, on the DRAM side and, and, uh, uh, like all the SSDs are tested at uh, in an oven, basically, while they're when they're being manufactured, they're all tested at a high temperature to make sure that they are uh, functioning uh, in an optimal fashion. Fantastic. Well, Mark, it has been a pleasure having you here. I appreciate your knowledge and, and sharing with us about about your SSDs and everything else that Kingston is up to. Um, how have things, you know, in closing, in closing today, um, how have things changed in 2020 for you folks? Like, are you still, um, you know, are you working in the office and, and have things been being manufactured and available to you or how have you been impacted? Well, so uh, there's there's been some impact and the, the main thing, like my job is always been uh, customer facing and going to visit clients. So mm -hmm. I'll go with salespeople um, and uh, travel with salespeople and go visit clients in person, which that's not happening right now. Yeah. Uh, but, but we're, you know, doing that virtually, uh, lots of uh, phone calls, Zoom meetings like everybody else. Um, you know, uh, our office actually is considered an essential industry. So um, because we do manufacturing, SSDs are critical components. Right. Uh, we make a lot of stuff that's used in, you know, servers uh, around the world and, uh, and vital to the government. Uh, so we, we can't just shut our operation down. And, uh, and we've actually been continuing uh, the manufacturing side pretty much as normal. You know, we, we have a lot of uh, protocols in place for safety. Uh, it, all the, the less essential folks like me that uh, like I don't have to go into the um, uh, manufacturing department and, and uh, put stuff together so I can do things from home and on the phone. So right. I go into the office maybe once or twice a week uh, and and uh, people on my team are pretty much in that realm. And mm -hmm. then, um, you know, there, there are other people there that go in, but we, you know, like when we go in, we've got like a camera that uh, measures our temperature and, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, all, all kinds of safety protocols. Everybody's, you know, like there, there's, I don't think there's anybody within 80 feet of my desk when I go into work. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, we're all, we're all pretty spread out. We're, I think yeah. we're only at like uh, uh, about 10, 10 to 20% capacity of people that are in the office at any one time. Good.
Well, keep up the great work and stay safe and kudos to you and your team. And, and uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is an amazing upgrade for our studio, these DC 500Rs. And I'd encourage anyone who's considering upgrading the, the drives at their, uh, in their server room, in their data center, no matter what scale, I guess that's the thing, right, Mark? It's, it doesn't matter if you're just a small business with a few staff or a big business running Facebook, as you say, um, it's going to make a huge difference in your in your data center. Faster is faster is like uh, and and less frustrating. That's right? true. That's you know, true. Like, uh, <laughs> nobody wants to spend time after they click on something. You know, it's like uh, I think Amazon's whittled that. You know, like how much how much a millisecond of wait time is you know in lost sales, right? Yeah. Is, when you, between the time I click and the time I get a response, there's a the the chance that I'll just cancel everything and walk, you know, goes way up, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, everybody deserves that uh, for their own stuff uh, at, at their home or their office. Like the way you think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Appreciate your time. Oh, you bet. Thank you. All the best. Take care. Appreciate you coming on. All right. Cheers. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. There will not be a CentOS Linux 9. Debian officially supports the Pinebook Pro. The EU is pushing for home workers to have the right to disconnect. And scientists have created a plane that flies without fuel. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. If you enjoy your weekly tech news with a slight Linux bias, become part of our fleet. Choose your rank at patreon.com slash category5. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Prepare to find your next distro, CentOS sysadmins. There will not be a CentOS 9. For years, CentOS has been a stable open source release based on and functionally compatible with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. That all ended this week in what some users are calling a betrayal to the FOSS community, when Red Hat announced it is severing support for CentOS, and the CentOS team simultaneously said they're moving to a rolling release with their CentOS stream distro. A user commented on the CentOS blog post saying, this is dumb. The entire premise and the only reason anyone uses CentOS is because it's a rebuilt Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Congratulations on undermining that, nitwits. The OP received many plus ones for their spot on insight. Will this mean transitioning to a CentOS stream? Will the shift to a rolling release result in more admins looking at trusted alternatives such as Ubuntu or Debian? Red Hat said in their announcement Tuesday, we believe that the real value of open source lies in innovating and solving problems and have learned that a rebuild or clone doesn't provide that opportunity. Are you a CentOS user? Do you feel betrayed by your trusted distro? Or are you excited to see what's next with the CentOS stream? Comment below. Updates for the CentOS Linux 8 distribution will continue until the end of 2021. CentOS Linux 7 users will thank the stars they chose the LTS since support will continue until June 30th, 2024. CentOS Stream 9 will launch next summer. I am not a Red Hat user, mm. um, so it doesn't impact me. Uh, but I know. Well, good for you, Jeff. <laughs> but I can I can <laughs> see how this would have a significant impact to just suddenly walk away. Now, thankfully, yeah. they're taking a year to transition. But how do you just cut ties like that? Yeah, and uh, now I am I'm also not a Red Hat user, or CentOS user. I'm very much a Debian baby, as our viewers know. Absolutely, yeah. I love Debian and Debian derivatives. Um, but in this case, now who does this impact? I mean, I've got customers who. Uh, who do use CentOS. I know oh, some okay. sysadmins who use CentOS. And in fact, my church uses CentOS as their email service um, oh, server. Okay. And so it leaves them in a weird situation where, okay, you know, uh, hey, I've been trying to transition them over to, you know, some, <laughs> some other service for some time. But now it comes down to, okay, now the very operating system, the very distribution that you are using for your main server is no longer supported. Right. And is being cut off and, and all ties are being cut off from Red Hat. So, I mean, it, it is really a burn. Um, you know, we're going to see in the next coming months, because, uh, you know, a lot of stuff right now is what is the reaction of the user base? And so yeah. some of the news comes from 
that reaction. Yeah. So what's the response of the sysadmin? Well, the response is like, we feel betrayed. Right. But the one thing, and I, and I do somewhat agree with the comment from, from Red Hat, is that you know the community is about advancing and growing and developing as opposed to just building off something that's older. So I get why they want to make this move. I don't even know if that's the point. It's more like CentOS is basically an alternative to yes. Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Red Hat right. Enterprise Linux, of course, requires the purchase of licensing. Yeah. So does that come into play where, well, we don't really want to support the clone that everyone is using <laughs> because we don't get paid for it? Again, you know, don't shoot the messenger. I'm, you know, a lot of stuff right now, it's very, very fresh in the news, uh, comes from the reactionary response of yeah. the sysadmin. And, and right now it feels like Red Hat has pulled the plug on something great and it's going to hurt a lot of people. And, and not only like hurt, but like it's really tough to suddenly have support yanked out from under you right. on a distribution that you've been using for 10 years. And how easy, and I say that kind of, tongue in cheek how easy is it to walk away from that and switch to a new system like yeah, I think you'd have like for anybody who's using it i'm you know thinking your church they have to build a whole new system essentially like that's well, not simple here's the choice the choice becomes do we now transition to centos stream mm -hmm. which is a rolling release which is what centos that that was the appeal of CentOS is that it was not a rolling release. Yeah. So now, do we go to uh, CentOS Stream and become a rolling release, or do we start looking at Debian, which is going to fall under that category? Ubuntu is very well supported by Canonical. Mm -hmm. um, so it it opens up now. Uh, now we need to start looking at okay, well if if we're no longer going to be on this, what, we, what we're going to call a stable release, and what I mean by that is not, not that anything else is unstable in the traditional sense, but we've got two different release models. Yeah. You've got that, like, here's a distro that you can install, and it's just going to continue maintaining itself for years, versus the rolling release cycle where you need to keep it up to date all the time. You need to upgrade to the next distro or the next version of the distro. And could have some breakage in the in the meantime, and yep. and so there's you know that that kind of support issue as well. So do we start looking at other distros? It'll be interesting to see, and only time's going to tell. So, I wonder too how much um, this might drive, uh, and not just the thought of moving to Debian or moving to Ubuntu, but does this also drive us to think should we consider some of the cloud options? I mean, well, if, if the that. church says, okay, well, our mail server is no longer supported, so are we going to transition this old mail server to something new, or are we just going to scrap it all together and say, you know what, let's just buy a NAS and use that for file sharing and go with one of the cloud options for email? That might be the better solution. So might be. I'm, I'm eager to hear your comments below. I'd love to know how this affects you, how it impacts you, what your thoughts are. Do you fall on the side of the sysadmin who is kind of feeling betrayed right now by Red Hat? Uh, and even so much as to say feeling betrayed by CentOS? Um, or do you fall into the, the camp where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to have to transition to something and it's exciting and it's a chance to try something new and fresh uh, where do you fall? Comment below. Love mm -hmm. to hear from you. On the coattail of Ubuntu's announcement of official support for the Raspberry Pi 4, it seems Debian doesn't want to be left out. Their next release contains a Debian installer enhanced for ARM devices, with official support out of the box for, among others, the $200 Pinebook Pro, Pro Linux laptop from Pine64. An alpha version of the Debian installer for Buster's successor, Bullseye, has added support for the Linux 5.9 kernel series and improvements to the ARM64 architecture support. Along with that comes support for the new ARM devices, including not only Pine64's Pinebook Pro, but also the original $99 Pinebook. Support has also been added for the friendly ARM's NanoPi Neo Air and NanoPi Neo Plus 2, as well as several other single-board computers from a variety of manufacturers. Could we be starting to see the transition to an ARM-based server room? Post your thoughts in the comments below. 
We've still got a half a year left before Debian 11 goes stable, but Bullseye is available now as Debian testing, so if you're particularly adventurous or just really want to get a Debian-powered Pinebook Pro for Christmas, feel free to give it a try now. Becca raises an interesting point in that you know, could this be the start of a transition in the server room? We were talking about CentOS and, yep. and the transition there, but could this be the start of a transition not only to new distribution, but also new architecture? I think it could. I mean, I, I have I have watched ARM grow and gain more um, user base in the yeah. last probably year. It's been pretty significant. It's happening quickly. Very quickly. And so I'm very intrigued to see where this takes things. Mm -hmm. Because I do think ARM could really become the new standard. It's fast and it's cheap. Yeah. And not only that, but to think of all of the single board computers out there that are ARM based, I mean, maybe there's still a hesitation to put um, at least to rely and depend on single board computing in yeah. the in the data center. Right. And that there is some truth in that. And, and part of that comes from the reliability of storage. So you think about a Raspberry Pi with an SD card. Well, do you really want your entire infrastructure housed on an SD card? Probably not. No. But ARM is a lot more than just single board computers, and it's not limited to SD cards. You look at things from, you know, boards from Odroid, you look at boards from Pine64 and other competitors to Raspberry Pi, and they all support eMMC. Yeah. And in fact, a lot of them from both of those manufacturers and a lot of other manufacturers are supporting um, M.2. Yes. So you can stick an NVMe drive on your single board computer. Yeah. And now you're running like something that is screaming fast, super, super fast, super reliable, and uh, that belongs in the data center, if you ask me. I completely agree. And I mean, right now, you know, in my day job, we're dealing with servers and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And yeah. one of the things we've been talking about lately is getting our own server. And so, what, you know, with this story, it makes me think, are we at the point where we could run, uh, you know, take like a hosting server or, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a cloud server and run it off, you know, a Rock Pro 64 or something. Sure, why not? Where you've got it hooked <laughs> up to, you know, a whole bunch of terabyte hard drives through USB or something for yeah. the storage space. But that... Not even s USB. Like, think, well, and it has USB 3. Yeah. But, but think about um, iSCSI. Yeah, for example, yeah, sure. Right, good example. Um, but the data center isn't, I mean, SBCs flip the economics of the whole situation yes. on its head. Because rather than having one Intel server with two Xeon processors and 32 cores and, and Which are 100 like gigs of RAM. Power hogs. And super expensive. Yeah. Rather than having one of those to do 10 different things, you just have 10 single board computers doing those 10 different things. And your cost not only up front goes way down, but your cost ongoing for the, 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 you know, the actual power that you're using, the heat that you're generating, and, and the noise yeah. from those big old servers. I mean, it's really flipping it on its head. But keep in mind, Mac, uh, Apple are actually pushing their MacBook Pros and the MacBook Air and, yes. and um, their Mac lineup of hardware into the ARM architecture as well That's with right. the new yeah. M1 processors. So we're really, you know, it's not just single board computer hobbyist stuff anymore. We're talking Macs. Yeah, which and, is huge. And if we're talking Macs, which are, you know, they have that kind of aura about them of being an innovative company and they push trends and, and, and they kind of shift the industry in, in so many ways. Um, when are we going to start seeing real good, solid um, servers, like 1U, 2U, 3U servers that we can stick in our server rack in place of those Intel yeah. equivalents? That Absolutely. might happen. Well, we want to hear your thoughts. Let us know. Would you use an ARM-based single board computer to run your server. Mm. Where do you think this is going to take things? Let us know. Comment below. Send us in your thoughts. Now the EU is pushing for home uh, home workers to have the right to disconnect. I think that's very important. Oh, these absolutely. Days. Scientists have created a plane that flies without fuel. What? What? Becca's got these stories coming up. Stick around. Also, Robert's here with the Crypto Corner. Don't go anywhere.
to the world of cryptos and welcome back to the crypto corner today i've got two things for you first the first one is linked to the travel rule which says that when you've got co uh, coins on one exchange and you transfer them over to another exchange the first exchange has to also transmit the kyc data so know your customer so your street address passport picture and so on to the other exchange um, that looks like it's a law that will come on an international basis and that also means that if you want to transfer those coins out of the exchange onto your private wallet this exchange has to do a KYC on your private wallet so you have to prove that that private wallet is really yours how are they going to do that don't know yet but it looks like that's going to happen it's a law that uh, might happen here in the US and if it's happening here in the US it will happen everywhere so my recommendation at this stage is take your coins and get them off the exchange ASAP into your hardware wallet or any other wallet that you have. Because I don't know when this uh, law might or, uh, come into, into place. The other thing is coming um, to trading. So let's talk about a little bit about trading. And I'm sure you have seen this year uh, like CoinMarketCap or CoinGecko and you click on, Coin, on Bitcoin here in this case and then you've got the 30-day chart and then you've got a lot of people doing an analysis on those charts yeah they they pull out the candles and then they say this is a bull flag or head and shoulders or inverse i don't know what and there are two camps the first camp says mm, this can't be true i mean that might be true on the large caps like apple uh, real stocks but in cryptocurrencies they do anyway what they want and it's an international thing so it's not linked to a country like like let's say apple shares this uh, cryptocurrency is linked to many countries so why should uh, a trend um, be visible in a chart the other one is saying hold on that might be right for for stocks like here this is the apple stock where you can do an analysis and more or less fairly accurately no not accurately but you can predict which trend the the share is going um, and also a little bit in regards to cryptos because all those traders that are coming into our area um, they're coming from the traditional market they're accustomed to these chart analysis and therefore they will also apply them here so if they apply them here that means that uh, they will be somehow applicable to what we're doing too but there's another thing that is really interesting in regards to, um, to trading, and that's uh, on-chain data. So in other words, data that is coming from the exchange. So not from, um, or from the blockchain itself. So not from the trading part uh, that is visible that you've seen on CoinGecko or CoinMarketCap. It's data that is linked to uh, the blockchain like what are the miners currently doing who's transferring data over to an exchange and so on and so uh, there's a fantastic website which is called glassnode they are they have got tons of different charts and if you go into glassnode and then you click on uh, market indicators then you, this is what you will see and just to show you that there is some um, legitimacy uh, in regards to uh, those analysis so if we take you for example i don't know uh, which one do we want to take a look at the pure multiple it doesn't matter what that is but as you can see here let's um, let's take that note case away <clears throat> so as you can see here in this chart every time when there was an all-time high or a peak also this orange line went into the red area so that means, in other words, if you read this chart correctly, if an indicator, if this indicator goes into the pink area here, that uh, you have to start selling or looking into selling your coins. Uh, it might be a risky area if you keep them. That's not the only one. So there are others that other indicators, like here we've got the net unrealized profit and loss. Again, doesn't matter what that means. And I've got here free account, so it ends up, it ends here in uh, January 2020 but an annual account only costs twenty dollars a year so it's not a big deal um, but you can see here again when there was an all-time high uh, the indicator this uh, colored curve went into blue uh, all-time high blue all-time high blue so it's an interesting indicator i would say and here also all-time low red all-time low red 
Yeah, so if this thing goes into red, means go and buy. And if it being, I mean, it's not financial advice, of course, but if you you can more or less have these indicators to really see what the trend is and where the ship is sailing to. I find it really highly interesting, and let's see where that will end up to because uh, this is just junk industry and a lot of things can happen. But I just want to make you, make you aware of uh, these indicators that are on, uh, that are representing on-chain data. Anyway, that's it from me. I hope you liked it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. As always, I'd like to ask you for a thumbs up because it helps us in becoming known in the market. And as always, I'm looking forward to see you next week again. And thank you very much for watching. Bye bye. Thanks, Robert. Now, it may be confusing when it seems like Robert's giving financial advice and then we say we're not giving financial advice. Well, the fact is, is that we want to just arm you with the information that you need in order to understand how the market works so that you can make educated decisions. Right. Remember, we're not giving financial advice or encouraging you to invest, but only sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market at this time. Always remember that cryptocurrency is always changing and always volatile. Now back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Robbie. As the COVID-19 pandemic blurs the lines between home life and job life for many, the EU is fighting for home workers to have the right to disconnect. Lawmakers have passed a non-binding resolution arguing that home workers have the right to be unreachable by work. The European Parliament Employment Committee voted 31 to 6 with 18 abstentions in favor of allowing people to take time off and urge the European Commission to create rules that catch up with the new reality of work. Alex Egia Saliba, who spearheaded the resolution, says the pressure to always be reachable, always available is mounting, resulting in unpaid overtime and burnout. Many of us can relate. How about you? Has the need to work from home caused the line between work and private life to become hazy? Comment below and let us know. Lawmakers in favor of the new resolution say workers should be allowed to be offline without suffering employer retribution as a result. The right to, to disconnect in the EU must now be approved by the full chamber before it can be submitted to the commission and state government for a vote. You know, oh, sorry, I'm just taking a call from work. No, you're not. I you know, need to be able right? to turn off. Man. I need to be able to disconnect. Yes. I I'm think... busy doing my own thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love this story. And I like that uh, in, in the EU, they're kind of taking that approach to protect the workers because it's been a problem now for quite some time, yeah. even before COVID, with the rise of you know e-commerce and internet connectivity where people are not being able to turn off. Mm -hmm. Like I remember when I, you know, started at, uh, you know, my former job in 2007, I think, something okay. like that. And I had the BlackBerry. Yep. And that was Constantly always with me. Buzzing. Yeah, like I'd be laying in bed and 11:30 I'd get an email that comes in it's like Oh, yes. You know, and I never turned off. Yeah. And it became such an addiction almost. Sure. Not that I wanted to work, but it was like my mind was always going, is there an email waiting for me? Is there something there? Yeah. I love that they've taken this approach. Isn't it interesting though, Jeff, that by responding to those pings, you're actually training your coworkers and your employers that you're always available. Yes. And, and it's a hard thing. It's like, where is that line? And, and you know, we're, we're probably speaking to a lot of IT managers and, and folks that work in the IT department. And, and realistically, I mean, servers go down regardless of whether it's past 5 p.m. or not. That's right. And guess what? We're the folks that have to run into the, to the office and take care of things. I mean, yeah. how many times have I spent a Saturday fixing up a server or doing something to do oh, with yeah. work because something's down and, and it's got to be attended to. It's like you can't, it's not a nine to five job when you That's work right. in IT. And a lot of things these days are not nine to five jobs. And you're lucky if you have something that you can actually shut down and say, call it quits at five o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. But realistically, and especially in today's, you know, kind of COVID-19 landscape where hey, people are working from home and when the computer, when the email comes in or when the ping comes in on Zoom, you've got to be there. Yep. And you feel like you've got to be there. And, and maybe that's part of it too, is maybe employers have to say, okay, so staff, here's our policy. We understand that you've got a life as well. We just expect you to put in a good, honest, hardworking day yep. and, uh, and then deal with 
the stuff that you need to deal with at home, but it's hard. I've been self-employed. I've worked at home. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And I mean, like in, you know, my former career as a, a labor contract negotiator, it used to be the thing was, you know, you've got your hours of work and then there's yeah. on call and then yeah. it, like all the kinds on of... On call, that's a burn. Yeah. Basically, like, you're, you're answering the phone no matter what. Well, yeah. And so those kind of things almost have been lost because it's like, oh, you're not really on the clock, but you're just always available. Yeah. And so, you know, it becomes that fine line between going too far and, you know, dare I say it, abusing the employee's time Mm -hmm. uh, versus being able to have maximum productivity and exposure to address issues as they happen. And so, it I mean, with online work and whatnot, it has changed the landscape of, like you said, a typical nine to five. And most jobs that have gone online are no longer nine to fives. Yeah. They're kind of, you know, your, your typical <laughs> full-time knows? work, but all, all around the clock. Yeah. I envy um, self-employed individuals who know to call it quits at five. And yeah. After five, it's like, all right, kids, let's have fun. Yeah. It's, it's time to, to hang out with mom or dad. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a hard thing to accomplish when you are, like, only a phone call away. That's right. And it's almost like, you know, your phone is in your pocket now and you're... You're stuck with it ringing. If uh, so, it's like have a separate phone. <laughs> yeah. What's your answer? I mean, we're all in this together. What is your solution to this particular issue? It may be a law that has to come down from the government, or it may be something that you've established within your own uh, within your own infrastructure of your company. Mm-hmm. We'd love to hear about it. Comment below. Here's Becca. A plane that flies without propellers or jets and uses no fuel sounds like something from Star Trek, but apparently. It's a thing. The secret is to use ion thrusters, which also sound like something from sci-fi. Next up, molecular teleportation. The team responsible is from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They say the electro-aerodynamic powered plane uses a propulsion system to fly, which could lead to new aircraft that are quieter and mechanically simpler than what we have today. What's more, they don't produce any fossil fuel emissions. All right, to be fair, we're not carrying passengers anytime soon. The aircraft has a wingspan of just five meters and weighs around two and a half kilograms, but it works. Having taken two years to create, the plane works by removing electrons from nitrogen molecules in the air, which produces ions. These are accelerated toward the back of the plane, creating an ionic wind, which gives the plane thrust to move through the air. Wouldn't it be incredible to have an RC version of this tech? Think about a quadcopter and how quickly its battery depletes. Now put an FPV camera on one of those ion-powered planes and rip through the air at high speeds for hours. While that raises some frightening militaristic possibilities, from a hobbyist perspective, it sounds incredible. What would you do with a small plane that could fly without fuel? Post your comment below. While quite inefficient at low-speed indoor test flights, the group said that as the speed increases, so does the efficiency. In theory, when moving at 670 miles per hour, the plane could be 50% efficient. It's still only a prototype, but scientists believe that the future possibilities are very promising. I think this is so neat that we now have, now granted it's a small version, but you have- Itty bitty. You have, what is this, an airplane for ants? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you have this propulsion system that doesn't require fuel, that has its own ability to convert within the air and keep going. I mean, in theory, if you could hook this sucker up to, say, solar panels, you could have nonstop flight. Nonstop. Theoretically. Unreal. Like, that's wild. Becca makes some really interesting points about, like, quadcopter flight. And yeah. I love flying my quadcopters, but she's right. The battery is, like... In some of them, it's like 15 minutes flight time. Mm -hmm. And so you buy extra batteries so that you can swap them in the field and you get, you know, 45 minutes flight time. But you're still dealing with the fact that the battery doesn't last very long. If you ever shoot any video in the air, it's the same kind of thing. Like you get up there, you take some video, and then you got to land and change the battery. Yep. Well, here's an opportunity, something that can actually uh, power itself, essentially. Yeah. But will it ever see... Passenger flight, that's the thing. Like, it, So it's more like... It's going to be tough. Nah, it's going to be more, I think, um, you know, smaller paylo- payloads. And this is where, you know, I think in terms of a camera or, you know, being able to, to shoot video, but they're, they're flying like an airplane. So yeah. it's going to be moving pretty quickly. 
so what about now we've had um, Henry Bailey Brown on the show to talk about how he uses his quadcopter yes. to shoot um, 3D um, uh, imagery yes. so that he can then convert that into Unreal Engine and uh, even 3D print uh, buildings and things like mm -hmm. that. But looking at topography and using a technology like this to keep constant tabs on changing landscapes or on like the, we think about like Bing Maps or Google Earth and the way that they're able to recreate our planet in basically what to us seems like real time, like sci-fi. Yeah. But being able to have something in the air that can just fly around the globe all the time, taking this imagery and shooting it back to their servers and making it like virtually, you know, much more real time than the satellite imagery that they have now. That's four years old. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Could those be things? But you know, what 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 kind of things spring to mind for you? And and of course, you know, in the back of my mind, there is that nagging. I fear that the military would get a hold of this kind of technology. Guaranteed, they're already using it. That's I why know, it's out. I know. And so this I is know probably from a military contract. <laughs> yeah, this is probably going through your head. And and so there, that is very ominous. And it's because this is a really really cool technology. Totally. But like so many cool technologies, it could be used for good and it could be used for we'll we'll say evil. Yep. Uh, but we, you know, what could we do with this that is good? That's so, what I'd love to know. And that's where my head went. Mm -hmm. Like. The fa what actually caught my attention the most in this story was the fact that it was indoor flight. Like initially, I was like, "Oh, they're flying it outside," but when they're like, "Oh, our tests indoors," I'm going, "Hold on, this is indoors." Okay, so could you theoretically take this, shrink it down? I mean, who knows what the components require? Are you picturing a fly? Well, no, no, <laughs> not that small. But like, how neat would it be if they could take this propulsion system to the point where it's. Um, you know, for lack of a better word, levitation, where you can have a stable object. That it can has to be moving, though. Well, it, it has, has to, to yeah. right now, but if you, because it's taking the ions from the air and converting them for that propulsion system. Yeah. So I don't know what, you know, the airflow is out behind or anything like that, but could it, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking, could it be converted to things in your home where it's like, you don't have to worry about ladders anymore because you can have you know, scaffolding or some some sort of painting unit We're that goes up for there, you. Jeff. But I'm just thinking the internal home use. I'm like, <laughs> this could change the way we build homes so that you don't have people falling off. How does he come up with this stuff? What are your ideas? Oh, he wants to build homes and get rid of ladders. This thing is like five meters wide and it can but only... But tech, and, and little little you could just convert it. That could be cool. living space, Jeff. Itty bitty living space. <sighs> See, I'm not confined to the initial thoughts. Yeah, all right. So when it can carry a human, Jeff wants it to lift him up onto his roof so that he can put up the Christmas lights a little easier. Pfft, I don't Perfect. Christmas lights. <laughs> My lights have been up for three hey, years. Give us your ideas. Comment below. Big thanks to Soul Boo, Roy W. Nash, and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Jeff, it's been great having you here again this week. Love great being here yeah. every time. Um, that's all the time that we have. Of course, uh, big thanks to our guest, Mark Noland, who joined us from Kingston today mm -hmm. uh, to talk about those drives. Uh, really, really exciting stuff. Hey, um, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. LinuxTechShow.com is a great way to find us there. Also, if you love what we do, please become a patron, patreon.com slash category five. But that's all the time we got. So we're out of here. Take yeah. care. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.